sex. I know your ears perked up, so listen. This is important. We're talking about sexually transmitted infections or STIs. While most people know what STD stands for, these days STI is both preferred and more accurate. As there's less stigma attached to the term infection and because most STIs never develop into diseases. And despite the name, STIs don't just spread through sex alone. Some can spread through blood, pregnancy, or just regular old skin-to-skin -skin contact. STIs are also very common, with an estimated 1 million new cases every day. And most people will have at least one STI in their lifetime. So why the stigma for something so normal? We've seen how the stigma around STIs has caused great harm to large groups of people in the past like during the HIV AIDS crisis, in which queer people, notably gay men, were unjustly scrutinized and subjected to violence. But something you may not have heard much about is what was known as the American Plan. Let's dive into this quick segment from the History Channel with sexual health advocate Suze Bubb to learn about it. During the 20th century, the American government had a widespread program in which they locked people up without trial for having sexually transmitted infections if they were women. The American plan detained tens of thousands of American women and forcibly examined them for STIs. If a woman tested positive, U.S. officials sent them to penal institutions without due process. This forced internment could last from a few days to many months. In these institutions, women were often injected with mercury or arsenic-based drugs. If women failed to show proper ladylike deference, they could be beaten, thrown into solitary confinement, or even sterilized. Enforcement of the American plan lasted over 50 years, but today few people have ever heard of it. Even fewer are aware that American plan laws enabling officials to examine people reasonably suspected of having STIs are still on the books in some form in every U.S. state today. Well, that is quite the sordid history. STIs are extremely common, but what can we do to avoid them? You've probably heard the phrase, I'd know if I had something. But since most STIs are asymptomatic, you can't actually know if you or a partner has an STI just by feeling or seeing something. Sex is inherently risky, and while safe sex might not exist, what does exist are safer sex practices. Getting screened for STIs routinely is important, but not all STIs are included. And while physical barriers like condoms or dental dams help a lot, they won't always protect you from STIs that spread through skin-to-skin -skin contact. As humans, we're prone to infections. We can get them from mundane activities like shopping, and we can get them when we woohoo too. The bottom line is, you can still get an STI despite your best efforts, and there's no shame if you do. Speaking of shame, let's unpack one of the most stigmatized STIs today, herpes. Here's what sex and culture critic Ella Dawson had to say about it during her TEDx talk. Two in three people in the world have herpes simplex virus strain one. It typically causes cold sores or oral herpes, but it can also cause genital outbreaks as it does in my case. And many are asymptomatic, but they can still transmit. There's also HSV2, which commonly causes genital outbreaks. That is, I believe one in six people, one in five women. It's super common. And then there's also herpes gladiatorum, by far the most badass name strain of any STI. It's actually not sexually transmitted. It commonly impacts high school and college wrestlers who get it from each other during wrestling matches. Also, chicken pox and shingles are in the herpes family of viruses. Obviously, they're not stigmatized and they're not sexually transmitted unless you're just really inventive. Herpes is everywhere, it's all around us, and it can carry this really out of whack, out of sync social stigma. You may have heard that some of the common STIs are on the rise, but their increases are nominal compared to one of the oldest STIs in the game, syphilis. While the CDC noted the highest number of cases in the U.S. in a decade, the U.K. Health Security Agency reported levels not seen since 1948. Australia saw figures rise by as much as 90%, and Canada saw a shocking increase of 389% between 2011 and 2019. Syphilis was almost eradicated just a couple of decades ago and is easily treatable in early stages. So what happened? Most people would be quick to blame promiscuity and modern dating, but scientists actually don't have one straight answer. They have a few. And some of them point to some general problems we face when it comes to sexual health infrastructure and support. Let's dig in with Sheena Williams of PBS Vitals and Allison Marshall, a clinical instructor and nurse practitioner. 
What happened in the pandemic, I think, is that we weren't able to get people into care. And so people who potentially either had mild symptoms and wanted to be checked, couldn't get in, or more frequently had no symptoms whatsoever. These are the people that we often catch at our well person visits. Now, it's important to say that this is not all about the pandemic. National funding for STI prevention is down more than 40% since 2003. That means fewer clinics, fewer places to test, and look what happened to the rate of syphilis over that same time. That record low that we had in the 2000s was directly related to the amount of federal funding that was spent as a result of the AIDS crisis. A few decades ago, almost 80% of young people were endorsing that they use condoms most of the time, and that number has decreased to 50%. That's a significant decline and speaks to a number of issues, one of which I think that is super important is the state of sex education. Eradicating the stigma surrounding STIs is actually paramount to the treatment and prevention of STIs. That means raising awareness, making space for open, transparent conversations that are free of judgment or shame, and increased funding for sexual health education, preventative treatment, and care. We always have and always will have sex, so we need to accept that infections are par for the course. Instead of abstinence-minded sex education, which fails to address the realities, we need more comprehensive, fact-based education that seeks to inform, not instill fear. The days of showing slideshows of gnarly extreme cases are over. Let's myth-bust common misconceptions around STIs and talk about how they actually work. There's so much to learn if we just move past the shame. So let's take it back to 1991 when Salt and Pepper said, let's talk about sex. Or keep talking about it rather, because silence is still the problem.